Good day to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, just as a quick reminder, this is the uh, first international metamaterials conference focusing on commercial and industrial applications. Um, and we're addressing here how these advanced materials can offer advantages in a wide variety of sectors and across various technology capabilities. Uh, this session, we're going to be focusing on uh, consumer electronics and photonics. You know, the use, the application of metamaterials in this area and its use within real consumer products. Um, as a quick introduction, you know, our everyday life is dominated by consumer electronics, be that from the openly obvious, such as mobile phones and computers, to the ones that we notice, but, uh, but do, the ones we do not notice, but we openly utilize, such as uh, shop good tracking, or even the checkouts at the shops uh, that we utilize. And then on to those that we do not see, but our everyday lives depend on, including the wraparound electronics and sensing systems on cars, the communications and the detection systems on aeroplanes. In this session today, we have three speakers uh, presenting themselves and their organizations innovation in consumer products that utilize material technologies that include metamaterials. And we'll end the session with a Q&A and discussion. So please do put some questions into the Q&A box, which is at the top right, for our, myself to go and ask them, and we can have a, a very interesting discussion at the end. So starting this consumer electronics and photonics uh, section, I would like to, uh, we're going to have three people. We have Irina Krova, Chief Technology Officer at Metaboard, based in Oxford. We then have Gleb. Asteroid, CTO, founder at Lumotive, based in Richmond, Seattle, USA. And we'll conclude with Paul Latwick, VP of Design and Computation at uh, Metalens, based in Boston, USA. So I think we've got a fantastic session to go on for today. And I would like to open up first by introducing Irina and ask her to uh, start by giving her presentation, please. Irina, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will now share my screen and I will please ask you to confirm if you can see my screen. Absolutely perfect, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks again uh, and uh, hello again. Uh, for those of you who have not seen me, uh, my name is Irina Kramova. I'm the CTO of Metalboards. I have already spoken at this uh, conference in the morning. Uh, it was a plenary session with a bit of um, it wasn't specifically focused on metaboards. Uh, so this short presentation is, is about metaboards. In fact, this is to present uh, our current focus, our current technology, and how metamaterials are helping us change the wireless charging landscape. Uh, metaboards is a company based in Oxford. We are spin out from Oxford University a few years ago. And we are focusing on wireless charging, which is the RF electronics area. Uh, I will give you uh, a bit of a background, although again, it may be a bit of a repetition if you have seen my talk uh, in the morning, but uh, for those of you who haven't uh, primarily, uh, we are seeing a surge in low power devices around us. This is in our daily lives, in our professional lives, even right now as I'm uh, presenting this talk, I look around my desktop and uh, my desk and uh, I see my Fitbit and my watch and my phone and all these little things lying around and uh, cables dangling to charge them. So uh, obviously, as we grow as a society, we will adopt more and more of these smart devices and both on the entertainment side and the nice to haves and on the uh, uh, must have side where we will delegate critical tasks to small helpers. And uh, as cable charging is inconvenient, I hope you will all agree with me on that. And uh, it is costly for manufacturers as well, because manufacturers need to supply a, a dedicated charger per device. So that adds the costs uh, into, the, into the pipeline. Uh, wireless charging kind of exists today. I say kind of because uh, for those of you who have used wireless charging, uh, you, you know that it is very much a one-to-one -one relationship between the transmitter and the receiver. So uh, you usually need uh, one transmitter per receiver, although there are, uh, uh, there are products out there that will charge three phones or phone and something else. 
but uh, most of them today require very uh, precise alignment. What MetaBoards are offering, and we are the first wireless charging company to have ever demonstrated uh, uh, this uh, level of user freedom. Uh, we are offering uh, a technology that can charge multiple devices at the same time, anywhere in a large surface from a single power source. And uh, our uh, technology uh, currently is uh, supported by the NFC structure, sorry, NFC infrastructure, uh, NFC standing for near field communication. And uh, this is something we use pretty much daily if you're using contactless payments or if you're using any form of contactless interaction between small electronics. This is usually a tiny little coil that sits in your uh, card or key fob, uh, and it will exchange data with another device that you're trying to interact with contactlessly. Um, so why we're so passionate about the NFC structure in particular uh, is because uh, it is so widespread and uh, it already is everywhere. People are familiar with it and it is also very cheap in terms of uh, incorporating and implementing an NFC platform in, a, in, a, in, a, in an electronic device. So the costs uh, are not significant if you want to add an NFC coil to your device. And uh, a couple of years ago, pretty much in the middle of the lockdown, there was a shining light in the form of uh, NFC forum announcing the uh, NFC wireless charging standard. So this huge platform now supports uh, wireless charging as an exchange of power between two devices that have uh, an NFC coil in them. Uh, obviously, this is not as simple as it seems. Of course, some modifications will be required, some upgrades, and the standard itself is in the works. It's, it's progressing uh, every, every month, every year, pretty much. But still, it's huge news. And specifically, it's tailored to low power electronic devices, such as smartwatches, uh, your uh, earbud cases, et cetera. This is a complementary standard to the well-known Qi standard. Uh, Qi standard is something that services our phones or tablets uh, and higher power electronic devices currently. Um, so uh, we, we, we were quite passionate to hear uh, when we heard about uh, the emerging NFC platform and we thought that this is exactly what uh, where Metabot's technology will make a huge difference uh, because we think we will help consumers get the freedom from wires and obviously, as I've said, OEMs to reduce their costs uh, and uh, we hope this, this platform will enable uh, the classrooms of the future to have a smarter environment and also in healthcare, we would we aspire to provide a technology that would um, change the way a sterile equipment is handled. So many opportunities here, really. Uh, we are proud to have built a very strong team and I'm a little bit biased, obviously, because I am part of this team, but I'm very proud to work uh, alongside all these people. We have a very strong uh, management with, uh, with, build, with a proven track record of successful businesses, building successful businesses. And our technical team is, uh, is very uh, is excellent, pretty much, uh, because the, we've, we've, we've built a combination of uh, skills and expertise that is necessary to uh, develop uh, a new technology that is based on something as unique as a meta material. Uh, obviously, we would like to acknowledge and thank our support network uh, from our investors uh, and, um, and our good connections in academia and also the innovation funds, uh, in particular the uh, Innovate UK, who've, uh, who, who uh, supported us through a smart grant uh, and a continuation grant. Um, so MetaBoards have a, uh, an IP portfolio that covers a range of aspects in our technology, and it is not uh, just the hardware, it is not just the meta material per se, it is not just the design of, of this charger. It is uh, obviously also related to how we control this charger. There is uh, the software aspect of our technology and all these things are protected by uh, our patents. We also have had to develop a lot of in-house design tools because again, it is such a niche area where on the, on the one hand, RF area is quite well developed. On the other hand, if we want to design something that is 
on a mesoscopic level, which is kind of borderline metamaterial and a multi-element system, we need uh, a specific tools. So we had to just develop them from, from scratch. So we have a set of proprietary tools uh, inside, uh, inside the company. Um, what do we mean when we say there is a metamaterial in our technology? Uh, this is pretty much an, a simplified illustration of what we mean by when we say that. If you imagine a, uh, a, a multi-element system where you have uh, a, 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 an array of uh, inductors that generate magnetic field, and these inductors are uh, uh, coupled, inductively coupled between each other, uh, with some form of control or not. It's, I'll come to that later. So uh, this multitude of elements could be seen as a medium where a wave of excitation propagates from one element to another, pretty much the same way a phonon would propagate um, uh, in, in, in solid state physics. So we take the system and we launch uh, this uh, magnetic inductive wave, as we call it, from the central point in this particular example, and it propagates through the surface, and we, uh, using our patented methods, guide this wave towards where the receiver is. Uh, and in this particular illustration, we have three receivers, and there is power delivered to each of them. We, our technology allows us not only to find and uh, locate these devices on the surface, uh, just using this single uh, input point, single power injection point, uh, but also to uh, find the best route to provide the best efficiency in power to those locations. And uh, it also uh, can handle the, the difference in the power rating. This is in the pipeline, but uh, our technology in principle can do that as well. Um, so currently what we have, and this is not our first demonstrator, but for the NFC space it is, uh, our NFC wireless charging technology is currently shown uh, in the form of a demonstrator device. It is a charger for, uh, for, for small electronic devices. Uh, uh, the charger itself is about 20, by, 20 meters by 20 centimeters, and it has a single power source. It is dynamically uh, controllable. So uh, as mentioned previously, we need to be able to uh, react uh, to slight changes on, in, in the environment, such as a device appears on the surface, a second device appears, one device is taken away from the surface. So all these things are done automatically within what our technology uh, can uh, offer. So we can localize, uh, we can find these devices, detect them and uh, root power directly into where they are. Um, we currently are uh, aiming to provide one watt of power per device as a maximum. And this is uh, governed by the uh, existing NFC standard, which uh, is basically uh, for that range of powers uh, from half a watt to a watt. Uh, the power transfer is happening at 13.56 megahertz, which is the NFC band. And uh, the uh, power channels, which are essentially uh, a metamaterial or metamedium uh, of connected resonators in a line or in an area. Um, these channels also support the NFC inbound communications, which makes our technology compatible with the NFC standard. So we can uh, basically integrate that directly into our uh, products and devices. Um, uh, so with that said, uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, we are needing wireless charging technology that is seamless, that is easy to use, and MetaWords is uh, aspiring to provide exactly that to the community. Um, I, I invite you to uh, uh, to contact us to um, <clears throat> to see our exhibition booth. So there is a there is a demonstrator waiting for those of you who want to see that, or I'm happy to answer any 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 of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's a great insight, and we've already got some brilliant questions up, lined up for that uh, um, at the end of this uh, session. So thank you so much for presenting on that. Um, and I think what we'll do is uh, we'll move on now to uh, to to Gleb, who is the uh, CTO and founder at uh, Lumotive, who is based in Richmond, Seattle, USA. Uh, Gleb, over to you, please. I'll Great, stay on yeah. just make sure. Thank you. Yeah, Redmond, uh, Redmond, Washington, actually. My apologies. Sorry, yeah, I've, uh, no I've read that off the map wrong. Sorry. Okay, let me share my screen.
All right. Please confirm that you can it's, see that. I can. It's, it's, it's not on the full screen, but it, it's... Uh, yeah, I'm getting there now. Perfect. How about now? Thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing it. Great. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and good morning and good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are. So again, yeah, I'm Club Axrod. I'm the CTO and founder of Lumotive. And it's my pleasure today to tell you about uh, what we're doing here at Lumotive, which is uh, developing the next generation of uh, solid state LIDAR based on our uh, solid state beam steering technology, um, of course, based on, on metamaterials, metasurfaces. So if you've heard about a LIDAR at all, it's probably been in the context of, of self-driving cars. It's been quite prominent and it's kind of one of the key uh, sensing technologies powering self-driving cars because it gives you direct 3D information about the world. Um, but our view on, the, on LIDAR is actually much broader than that. And in fact, we believe it's going to be the enabling sensing technologies for a number of autonomy and, and uh, augmented reality applications. In fact, we kind of see LIDAR becoming ubiquitous in the future in the same way that uh, cameras have become ubiquitous, right? There's, there's actually about 10 billion cameras made every year in everything from smartphones to security systems everywhere. Uh, and the reason they're so pervasive is because they're all based on semiconductor technology, extremely cheap, scalable, uh, high performance. Uh, and we believe something like some similar to that will happen with LIDAR. Uh, the LIDARs that you may have seen now, you know, are these big spinning things on top of self-driving cars cost hundreds of thousands of dollars based on mechanical systems. Uh, and we think this kind of semiconductorization that has happened to cameras is going to happen to LIDAR as well. Uh, and we're trying to be at the forefront of that. So a little bit about uh, Lumotive. Uh, we were founded officially in 2018, uh, but have been incubating the, the technology a little bit longer than that since about 2016. Um, so my personal background is I, I was a, I started working on metamaterials when I was a postdoc with uh, David Smith uh, at, at Duke University, uh, and then got connected through him uh, with Intellectual Ventures. Um, as some of uh, the other uh, companies that have commercialized metamaterials as well. Uh, and so started incubating a, our, our uh, optical metasurface technology while at Intellectual Ventures. Um, and then we spun that out officially in 2018 um, and have been building the company ever since. So we're about 30 people right now based in the, in the Seattle area that have offices in the, in the Bay Area and elsewhere as well. So as I said, our, you know, our core focus is on, on building a, a truly solid state and scalable uh, LiDAR solution. Um, it's also something we call software defined and I'll, I'll talk about what that means. One of our defining features is how scalable our, our technology is across multiple markets. Uh, and so my talk today will focus a little bit about what, what we're doing in automotive and also in consumer uh, electronics. Um, you can see a picture of some of our beam steering chips here, I'll, I'll talk about how they work, of course, um, and a couple of our products. So the one on the left here is called the U30 that's targeted at smartphone and AR applications. Uh, and this little golf ball size module is for automotive applications. So short range LiDAR to kind of put around the perimeter of the car. Um, so we've released our first product uh, uh, late last year called the M20 and that's currently being tested by over 15 customers uh, in various markets and automotive and industrial. Um, and of course, yeah, we've been working on this for a number of years, so have many patents and significant know-how covering this technology. So we really believe that, that LiDAR will be an enabling technology for, for multiple markets. Um, it's a, overall a, a huge market opportunity in total 45 billion. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of the focus in, in kind of the popular press has been LiDAR for self-driving cars, uh, specifically long-range LiDAR, but that's only actually a segment of the market, and the, the total market is much bigger than that. Uh, we see proliferation of LiDAR in, in smartphones, and we're already starting to see that. The, the latest iPhones actually have a, a small LiDAR sensor inside of them, and perhaps the biggest market opportunity is in enabling various types of autonomy for 
uh, for uh, robotics, uh, security applications, and also kind of low speed maneuvering in cars as well. So all of these applications need 3D sensing. Uh, and this is actually where our first product is, is focused. So what does this all have to do with, with uh, metamaterials and why are we so focused on, on beam steering? Um, and it turns out that, that beam steering is kind of at the heart of the LiDAR puzzle. Uh, from the early days of, of LiDAR, it's kind of been recognized that, that the future must be systems that are, that are solid state and semiconductor based. Um, and, and to date, that still for, for, to a large degree has not been achieved. So there's basically two ways of, of doing LiDAR systems. So LiDAR, of course, is based on sending out laser pulses into the environment and then measuring how long it takes for those pulses to come back. And that's how you build up a, a, a 3D map of the world called, called a point cloud. Um, so there's essentially two ways of doing this. You can do what's called a flash LiDAR, where you illuminate the entire field of view simultaneously and then measure all those pixels simultaneously so you don't move, steer your your laser power across the field of view the challenge with that is that it gives you relatively short range low resolution uh, doesn't work well outdoors when you when you have a lot of sunlight the the way to overcome those challenges is to move your optical energy across the the field of view and so kind of focus it in, in small parts um, and to do that of course you need to some way to scan scan the beam. Um, and to date, this has mostly been done with mechanical systems, uh, spinning mirrors, polygons, gobble mirrors, MEMS mirrors, anything that's mechanical. Um, and that's, that's basically what people do now. Uh, the challenge with that approach is that it doesn't scale uh, to different form factors. So it might work well for you know, a self-driving car, but it's not gonna scale down to a smartphone. Uh, and as with anything that's mechanical, you know, it's relatively high cost, has uh, reliability challenges. And from our point of view, maybe one of the, the biggest downsides is it's not what we call software defined. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of, of what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, and so that's why we focused on, on building a solid state beam steering technology. Uh, and we use metamaterial principles to do that because it addresses this, this fundamental challenge in LIDAR um, that's been there from the beginning. So what we did is um, we developed a, a, a dynamic optical metasurface uh, technology uh, based entirely on CMOS manufacturing uh, principles. So it's a, it's a reflective chip, it's a reflect array uh, with resonant, deeply sub-wavelength uh, metasurface elements covering the, the entire aperture. Uh, and then we tune these pixels using liquid crystals. So it's essentially a combination of a, a CMOS chip uh, with electronics on it and a, a liquid crystal display. And it allows us to steer over an extremely wide field of view. We can do up to 170 degrees of, of beam steering with, um, with no fall off and efficiency, extremely fast switching speeds of just a few microseconds. Um, and Importantly, not only can we scan continuously across the field of view as you can with a mechanical system, but you can actually hop around arbitrarily across the field of view um, and have software defined regions of interest um, because there's no mechanical inertia in this beam steering. I'm trying to play this video and unfortunately it's very choppy so you can't kind of see the, the smooth uh, kind of the, the idea I was talking about. The, hopping around in the field of view, but you can go to our website and, and perhaps uh, see this video. Yeah, so one of the consequences of uh, this, this beam steering technology is um, how scalable it is uh, across uh, different product lines. So we can make uh, large chips uh, to power uh, long range light or mid range light, or we can scale down the size of these beam steering chips and make extremely small size uh, LiDAR systems as well. And that's reflected in our product uh, uh, roadmap as well. And this is very unique among LiDAR companies that usually people focus on kind of one or the other. And we have this very scalable technology that's enabled by the, by the Metasurface technology. Um, so our first product is called the M20. We're shipping this now. It's targeted at industrial and automotive applications, basically a little golf ball sized LiDAR unit that can be integrated around the perimeter of the car or on, on robots. Uh, we're also working on 
the T30 now, which is a mid-range LiDAR product, and ultimately we'll be scaling that down for uh, consumer applications and then also scaling it up uh, for uh, long-range automotive applications, all using the same underlying beam steering technology uh, and complementary uh, receiver chips. So if you kind of peel back the onion and look at what's inside um, our LiDAR systems, they're all built in essentially the same way, in a very simple way, uh, very much like a, a camera module. And we designed it that way intentionally because camera modules are made by the billions every year, just like the ones in your smartphones. Um, and so we build our LiDAR systems in a very similar architecture. So the, the architecture basically contains key three, uh, three key uh, semiconductor components. Um, we have a, a Vixel laser, um, which is a simple semiconductor laser that illuminates our beam steering chip that steers a laser stripe uh, horizontally or vertically across the field of view. And then we send out laser pulses in each part of the field of view in the stripe and then image it onto a two-dimensional detector array um, in, in a little stripe like this. And then by scanning across the field of view, that's how we ultimately uh, build up the entire frame. So it's essentially, you know, got this, the, the simplicity and, and small size and low cost of a camera, but we're combining that with the performance of what you typically get with the mechanical light. And that combination uh, hasn't been present in the market before. So again, this is the M20 that we're shipping now. Uh, these images that you see here are kind of the output of the LiDAR system that's called a point cloud. So essentially it's a 3D map of the environment and that's ultimately what our customers consume is this three-dimensional data. Um, so now I wanna show you a live video. Let's see how well this works. So this is a, an indoor video of um, some of our engineers playing ping pong um, just to give you an idea of the kind of high resolution depth information that you can get. So it's almost kind of camera like information. In fact, you can fuse the 3D data here with, with RGB data from a, from a camera. Um, and a little bit later, I'll, I'll show you. So this is a, a static field of view that I'm demonstrating, but we can also reconfigure the field of view to be dynamic using the software defined features that I talked about. So that's an indoor demo. Of course, we do a lot of um, outdoor testing as well for our automotive customers. Um, so here's one of our LiDAR units uh, mounted on what we call the Lumobile. It's our uh, Lumotive car um, and these M20s. So this, this is a LiDAR unit that's mounted on top of the car. That's one of our long range LiDARs. Uh, but we also mount the M20s that I just showed you around the perimeter of the car to give you essentially a 3D uh, a safety bubble around the vehicle. So that's that's how the M20 is used. Okay, so talking a little bit more detail about the uh, the core technology, uh, we call it light control meta surface uh, technology. So again, it's a reflective chip um, with resonant optical antennas on it. Uh, we're truly in the meta surface regime. We're under land over two, so. Um, we have arbitrary uh, field of view with no grading lobes that you sometimes get from optical phased arrays. Um, our core innovation was to figure out how to design these pixels to be uh, manufacturable in a standard CMOS process and at the same time to have the optical properties, uh, you know, with high phase tuning. Uh, and, and high efficiency at the same time. And that, that's, that was one of the, the big challenges that we overcame. So some high level specs, you know, we can do over 170 degrees of beam steering uh, with uniform efficiency across the field of view, very fast switching speed uh, at 25 microseconds, which is kind of unprecedented for liquid crystal devices. Usually they're on a time scale of milliseconds. Um, so I can read my slide here. Uh, the switching speed and then the field of view is independent of the aperture size. Um, 
which is very different from mechanical systems. So we can scale up or scale down the chip and all the properties about efficiency and switching speeds stay the same. Um, we manufacture in a standard CMOS process. We can be compatible with different laser wavelengths and different uh, transceiver modulation schemes, either uh, time of flight or FMCW, which is a coherent type of approach to doing LIDAR. And yeah, we're, and I already mentioned the, the scalable uh, aperture size. Yeah, so the basic idea is that we program a, uh, a blaze diffraction grating on the surface of the chip. And then by changing electronically the pitch of that blaze diffraction grating, that's what uh, essentially changes the, the angle of diffraction. Um, so, you know, kind of the standard optical phase array approach, but without the the challenges associated with, with OPAs like low efficiency and grading lobes. Um, and that's the advantage of using the, the resonant uh, metasurface approach. So we've been working on this technology for four years now. Uh, we have a, a semiconductor partner that manufactures the chips uh, in, in their uh, standard CMOS process that we've modified with them. Um, uh, it's an eight inch, uh, 130 nanometer CMOS process. So very kind of mature, scalable technology. Uh, you can see several generations of our, our chips here of different sizes. So we make these uh, CMOS wafers. Uh, that's how we implement the pixel structures. And then to make them tunable, we go to a, a packaging technology called liquid crystal on silicon uh, assembly. Uh, where we essentially take the, the wafers, put a cover glass on top of it, and then inject the crystals in the sandwich. Uh, and this is an assembly technology that's been used in the display industry for a couple of decades. So kind of across the board, using very mature uh, manufacturing technologies, but combining it with this very unique design. And in fact, that, that's kind of at the core of our innovation is, is finding that very difficult overlap between the requirements of the optical design of the metasurface design and what's manufacturable. Uh, and if you know anything about uh, semiconductor foundries, uh, the one thing you'll know is that they're extremely conservative. It's very, very difficult for them to get them to change anything, um, not to mention introducing new materials into the process. Um, so one of our challenges was to identified pixel structures that are not only CMOS compatible, sometimes people call that, talk about CMOS compatibility, but we had to go really a step further and, and talk about CMOS standards. So you really have to use materials that are standard, not just compatible uh, with CMOS manufacturing. We want it to be in a mature technology node, right? So we don't want to go to something like 20 nanometer node because that's very expensive and hard to develop on. Uh, and you have to design your pixel structures to be very robust to geometric tolerances, right? Because we're not just trying to make one device, we're trying to make billions of these. So yield and manufacturability is extremely important. So you have to balance these factors at the same time with all the optical constraints, like understanding your Q factor, having high efficiency um, uh, and, and low absorption, high phase coverage, and being uh, lambda over two at the same time and reducing your, your coupling both electromagnetic and, and liquid crystal coupling between the elements. So a lot of constraints and, and very challenging to find that, that overlap in the, in the pixel design. But you know, I think we've successfully done that. So just a few examples. This is some of the electromagnetic simulations that we do. This is a 64 element uh, uh, liquid crystal metasurface uh, being simulated here. Um, so we kind of do, do the design from first principles and then work very closely with our semiconductor foundry to understand their limitations and understand the, the optical design limitations at the same time. So one of the consequences of this is that we, we've been able to build a very high efficiency uh, technology. So this is an example of our efficiency across the, the field of view. Uh, you can see that it's uh, this particular uh, measurement is uh, over uh, about 100 degrees, but we can go much wider than that. Um, so you can see the efficiency is over 50%, um, uh, which is pretty remarkable um, uh, for a solid state technology. 
Um, and then the, the losses that we do have are kind of split two ways between uh, radiative and, and, and beam losses. So meaning radiative losses, meaning uh, absorption in the chip. Um, and then the rest of the efficiency loss is due to side loops because we don't have perfect phase control on the element. So it's essentially side loops that, that you create or diffractive losses. So one of the cool things about this technology that our customers really like is the uh, is the software programmability. So if you look at a mechanical uh, beam steering element, uh, its angle as a function of time is a continuous function. Um, and so your angle order has to be sequential uh, and you can't dwell on a particular angle for a longer amount of time because your mirror is always moving, right? It's got mechanical inertia. But with our beam steering technology, um, not only is it solid state, but it's also what we call digital or, or discrete, right? So the angles across the field of view that we can steer to are, are dis discretized by, by kind of the geometry of the chip. Um, and then our ability to switch between the angles is non-sequential. So it always takes us about 25 microseconds to switch between any pair of angles, regardless of where it is in the field of view. And then we can dwell on each pixel for any amount of time because it's a stop and go beam steering, right? So we can dwell on an angle for longer um, to get longer range, for example. So the way this uh, works in practice, and I don't know if this will work in situ. So let me switch to my browser to show you this video. Can you still see this? Still see a slide. Okay, great. So I don't know how well this will render on Zoom as usual, but this video is also on our website. So this is demonstrating the software defined capability where uh, we're dynamically tracking an object across the field of view by changing the region of interest that the LiDAR is scanning in real time in feedback to what the LiDAR is seeing. And so this is done completely kind of in the loop uh, in a software defined way. Um, and so our customers, essentially what we've done is create a, a software API where our customers can reprogram the LiDAR uh, in real time, um, uh, depending on what data they're, they're collecting. So this is a very powerful feature. So by doing this in this particular example, by doing this region of interest, we can get an extremely uh, high frame rate around the object, about uh, 60 frames per second in this case. Fantastic, Seagab. Just as a quick warning about timing. We, uh, yeah, that's actually to... my last slide. That is it. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, thanks for joining and for your attention. Um, and look forward to any upcoming questions. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for the videos there. Uh, I hope they came through properly, but as you said, they're on your website as well. But um, absolutely fantastic to go and see how they work in real life. We mentioned cars before, uh, but to actually see the dots and the process that are happening behind the scenes, brilliant to see. So looking forward to the questions uh, shortly. Um, may I move on now to uh, Pal, a VP of Design and Computation at uh, Metal Ends. Uh, based in Boston, USA. Hopefully I got the city right there this time. Paul, right. over to you. Thank you, Sven. My so, pleasure. yep. So as uh, a lot of the speakers before me have been been uh, kind of sharing their experiences implementing metasurfaces in their products and, and their technologies, uh, what we do at Metalens is we're kind of implementing uh, or using metasurfaces, not necessarily in uh, dynamic applications per se, but rather as almost a, a platform for these kind of passive optical components. Um, the approach that we're taking is very similar in that uh, we are seeking to use and leverage existing semiconductor foundries, standard techniques, um, not too crazy process nodes in order to be able to really make these, uh, make these structures at scale um, and uh, with the requirements uh, that are needed to meet today's demanding uh, consumer electronic applications. The picture in, in behind on the title is exactly that. It's, it's these uh, 
optical um, lenses or diffusers or other kind of passive components, which are printed on a wafer in this uh, planar process. A little bit about Metalens. So we've spun out of Harvard University and really our focus is commercializing these kind of meta optics, uh, meta, meta optical systems. Um, likewise, we're, we're not interested in actually making these chips uh, ourselves. We know that there's a lot of uh, industry investment and a lot of um, opportunity out there uh, that we can uh, instead seek to make partnerships with folks to then uh, use their boundaries, use their processes um, in a kind of a standard way to be able to make metasurfaces uh, and bring really the, the promise of um, having optical systems made at a semiconductor foundry instead of uh, kind of with these traditional processes. As Sven mentioned, we're Boston based with around 20 employees and growing, and we have a cohort of investors that are on the bottom. So what does a uh, metasurface in our case actually look like? Uh, we're using these standard CMOS uh, principles. So for that, that really means um, glass and silicon. Um, and with these kind of components, uh, that's all we really need to be able to shape these arbitrary wavefronts, which in turn implies some kind of optical system or achieving some kind of optical function. Uh, on this left-hand side, so we're using um, not just eight inch wafers, but actually these 12 inch uh, wafers for uh, these passive optical components uh, where we can print you know, thousands or possibly even tens of thousands of devices on a single wafer and then be able to uh, share that um, with uh, or embed that within uh, some kind of optical system. From the top down, uh, this is a, a, a scanning electron micrograph of what that looks like. Um, what you see here are these different pillars of different shapes and sizes. These are all dielectric pillars uh, fashioned out of silicon in this case. Uh, and when the light um, kind of shown schematically here, when light from uh, some field point or from some optical ray, for instance, is incident upon our, uh, dial our dielectric system with these varying diameters, these diameters give the, give the light a chance to reshape and remold into the optical function that we desire. Um, so essentially the, the geometric parameters of these structures translate to um, some kind of change in phase as, as Gleb was mentioning earlier. From a cross section, you can see here is we have our uh, substrate on the, on the lower level, as well as some kind of, as well as these pillars embedded in some kind of encapsulant so that they're very robust to environmental uh, as well, um, environmental kind of uh, like humidity or temperature, um, and they're protected in that sense. If you're familiar with diffractive optics, that's what this is essentially, except really seen through a new lens of uh, this kind of uh, metasurface physics. Uh, this uh, quick kind of video is showing how light gets molded through this kind of system. In this case, we're looking at it through a transmissive point of view. So the light is being shot up from uh, below and then it passes through our dielectric uh, you know, single layer. Uh, and then gets molded into some kind of focusing element where most of the light is then um, concentrated uh, at some kind of uh, focal spot. So one thing to mention, of course, is that, you know, diffractive optics are nothing really new uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, diffractive optics have existed even in foundries for, for quite some time. Um, however, getting what, the, what metasurfaces really provide is the ability to essentially tune the phase profile almost continuously uh, across um, across the desired or target phase profile that you want to achieve. Whereas diffractive optics and foundries are usually they're kind of some kind of binary diffractive optic um, where you can only achieve uh, you know, zero or pi phase shift, or there might be some kind of multi-level DOE where you can maybe uh, achieve maybe four different phase levels, but again, not to the uh, continuous level that you want. And also that multi-level DOE has to have many multiple process steps in order to achieve that. Uh, which then in turn drives up cost, uh, lowers yield, um, and it's just more difficult to manufacture. Whereas for us, we just can place everything in one layer, fabricate it, and then we're ready to go. So that's kind of the platform, but what are the kind of the applications that uh, have been uh, successful in terms of uh, garnering interest from uh, customers? 
So um, as was mentioned previously, uh, really in your consumer electronic devices, specifically mobile phones or uh, your um, robot vacuum cleaners, a lot of uh, effort is being put into how do we understand the 3D environment? Um, how do we look at a scene and then be able to parse that into some kind of um, something that could be useful for an end user? Um, and there's a lot of different kind of technologies or ways that that can, can go. Um, but here I've kind of highlighted two, which is usually some kind of flood illumination um, as Gleb also had a schematic of this where um, the light is spread out across some kind of person's face. Uh, and then finally, uh, this dot pattern projection where you're actually projecting some kind of structured illumination pattern on someone's face or on some kind of object. And then from knowing that uh, pattern, you're able to uh, distinguish how far away uh, some, some dots are compared to others. Um, and so these are usually some relatively narrow field of view applications. Um, but this is, for instance, how your face ID works. Uh, now, uh, so at Metalens, you know, it's not just about the level that optical layer; it's about the system itself. Um, and you know, if we were just if we were just to stop at that that chip, um, that wouldn't be super, super interesting, right? We have to figure out what we can do with that. Uh, and really, what we see is that uh, as we try to apply these technologies to these conventional optical systems, we unlock a lot of capability, or we can drastically simplify um, what these end up looking like. Um, so we've kind of segmented out these two different market areas where we have maybe a front-facing dot pattern projection type system, where conventionally there's a multiple elements um, in addition to some kind of directive optical element, where that can be supplanted by a suitably designed uh, metasurface or metal lens optical element. Additionally, this kind of world-facing dot pattern projector, uh, which mostly just differs in terms of how far away you want these dots to project, um, can be simplified from this kind of three-piece uh, system into just maybe a single-piece uh, system where our metasurface is taking the place of not just the projection optics, but also the diffractive optics, which can tile or expand the field of view of the, of the dot pattern projector. And that ultimately translates to you know, a simpler system, uh, which may be more accessible to a wider variety of companies or at the end of the day, consumers. So what this dot pattern projector looks like is um, essentially uh, we have some kind of Vixel array. Uh, again, uh, this is essentially just an array of lasers um, that are on a chip, very easy to, to buy nowadays. And that single array is then projected onto the scene uh, using the projection optics that are embedded uh, or designed into the metastrophus layer. And so that would give you this single kind of uh, image right here. Now, if we want to actually project not just a single tile, or if we want to fill some kind of field of view, given a fixed constraint on how big this pixel is, we can actually tile that. Um, and then also, in addition to the project, projection optics, embed this diffractive um, tiling um, in a single, in the same exact layer as uh, the as the projection optic kind of phase function, so to speak. Uh, so, because metasurfaces are passive optical elements, uh, we're not doing the dynamics, um, but we can consider uh, that the dynamics can be actuated in some other fashion. So for instance, um, if the Vixel array is selectively addressable, then you can kind of emulate some kind of scanning configuration or some scanning like configuration um, with, by, by combining the, that addressable Vixel with this passive optical element that the metasurface has. Um, and so again, I'm just going to uh, kind of narrate this. Um, we have the dots that you kind of saw beforehand. Um, marching across the screen um, as basically different rows of the Vixel turn on and off. So we have this uh, available for sampling this to customers um, in a few different uh, kind of prototype boards. Um, namely, we have one on the left-hand side uh, where, it's, where it's more like a chip on board type setup. And then we have this SMD type of packaging, which is very compact um, and again, really targeted for these mobile applications. So we're really uh, squeezing that um, that module down. Um, for So that was kind of for these sparser dots um, and for these maybe world-facing applications. For uh, front-facing applications, what we actually want uh, is something with finer dot control, um, smaller uh, 
resolution so they can really pick out uh, what are the fine features of a face or um, whatever the, the scene or selfie you're taking. Um, and so for this, we can use exactly the same technology, uh, just modify, redesign, and so on in order to get these uh, much finer um, uh, kind of features that are projected onto that image. And so this is, uh, again, kind of just a quick uh, demonstration of what that looks like. Um, we have on the right-hand side uh, what um, our 3D model here. Uh, and then uh, this is a real life kind of image of us rotating that model and then seeing that how the dot pattern projection uh, really ch uh, changes as the contours or distance of that face change. And so this is sort of a uh, kind of a way to get your hands on how you can translate um, the closeness or relationships between dots to some kind of 3D or spatial information. But again, we're a platform technology. I've mostly been speaking on the illumination side. Uh, we're also interested, of course, in imaging, um, where likewise, there can be uh, similar gains to be made by switching from a conventional type of refractive optical system to a single element uh, metasurface system. But we're still doing imaging, much like you know traditionally people do imaging or design imaging systems. It's just by having this planar layer, we're able to access maybe a different design space um, than what other folks have, have been able to do. In addition, since we're not strictly speaking diffractive optics, uh, we actually see a lot better performance than what a equivalent system implemented with refractives would be able to do in terms of you know, robustness, reliability, as well as uh, minimizing stray light and these other unwanted features in imaging. So metasurfaces are not without their challenges. Uh, really, our goal is to design for manufacturer to work with our foundry partners in order to uh, be the best metasurfaces that we can be. However, uh, what, how are the, what are the different failure modes um, for metasurfaces? Uh, because we're very much akin to diffractive optics, uh, we see kind of the same issues where there might be some kind of high functional transmission, which is the transmission that we're targeting. But uh, specular transmission, um, or what some folks call zero order, can also uh, kind of creep in there if your manufacturing isn't spot on, as well as higher orders or uh, reflected um, orders from that metasurface element. And so really working with the foundry, doing a lot of simulations, building in our design know-how, and having custom tool tooling to be able to kind of handle that is really one of the, one of the really challenges, but also opportunities that we as metal lens have been taking. So, you know, how do you interface with foundries? How do you interface, how do you talk about metasurfaces with anyone, especially folks who haven't necessarily seen these kinds of structures before? Um, although there's a lot of different uh, perspectives on how to think about or how to design these uh, kinds of systems, ultimately you need to talk to someone, you need to communicate with them and have them understand this is going well, this is not going well. So. With that, in that respect, uh, a parameterized framework for talking about, you know, what is our pillar shape? Um, how far is that pillar shape from nominal? And then translating that to across this process parameter distribution, what are we actually getting in terms of our merit function? Um, so maybe that's functional efficiency, for instance. And so uh, these are full wave simulations, full wave computational electromagnetic simulations. We need to run many thousands of them. So how do we do that fast? How do we do that? to sufficient rigor um, to be able to achieve these kinds of, um, to hit these decision points and to make decisions from them. Uh, so we have this kind of elastic sort of home-built platform to do both global as well as local sensitivity analysis, uh, sensitivity analysis. And both of these kinds of techniques can help us drive decision-making, not just to get the nominal design, but also to tune that nominal design for a particular process and understand process yields and process constraints, uh, which is ultimately um, we need to work with the foundry to, to nail down. And so, I mean, I spoke about this at the very front, but uh, this is kind of how the general process flow uh, ends up working for, for a metasurface type lens. Uh, we basically do the design, uh, work with the foundry to understand their design constraints, design rules, um, as well as you know, hopefully get the opportunity to uh, work with them to 
push the frontier of the technology. And then once we've kind of settled on that, settled on the design, uh, we work with them to ultimately get this kind of end product where we have a 12 inch wafer, um, usually silicon on glass with uh, tens of thousands of meta optics. And so once we have that wafer, uh, then that goes on to simulating. Um, so parsing out that wafer into multiple components and then, or also into just backend integration. So putting that onto a sensor, putting that into a module, um, or building that into some kind of optical system where, which we can deliver to a consumer or to uh, some kind of OEM. So in summary, uh, meta surfaces uh, can do a lot, but they have to work within the optical system to provide um, potentially simpler, brighter and better modules. Uh, design capability there is, is really a key in order to understand how we can work with foundries uh, to address the challenges that do arise with metasurfaces, which uh, maybe you're not getting with refractives. Um, but that is an opportunity to enable scalable mass production, production of metasurfaces uh, and to achieve kind of new regimes. Um, so uh, with that, you know, uh, we are mass production ready and uh, we hope to kind of enable sensing in consumer electronics, really bring it out from maybe these top tier phones and also enable it for uh, the, really the broader consumer electronic market. So thank you. Oh, many thanks for that uh, fantastic presentation and very interesting seeing the use of uh, silicon wafers as part of your uh, your process uh, there and ongoing. It's uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please put questions in to the speakers in the top right hand corner of the screen. There should be a Q&A box and I'll be asking them. We already have a few for me to go through, but uh, I, I want to just say, say a summary that I see because, of course, this section is on commercialization. So a thank you to Irina, Gleb, Powell uh, on, on all your discussions. But my feeling of the summary of this is that um, the metamaterial is a single component which within a more complex, I won't say standard system, but within a more complex um, historic uh, already existing system. And that you're utilizing the metamaterials, I feel all of you, to bring about a improvement in capability and the system capability with a wish for the to, to address a new market and uh, improve the market or broaden the market with a wish on possibly for the future for the price to 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 reduce but at this point it's the, the key component is that meta material in the in the middle um and we're actually going to go back to rena you started this morning talking about meta materials are they are they real or not? Was almost the summary. How do you feel about that that comment there? That the meta material is just a single component within a much wider product that you're developing. Um, well, uh, again, it's not a question of whether they are real or not. It's about meta materials have become such a broad notion that uh, the boundaries have stretched by that much. So everything that remotely reminds a meta material has become a meta material essentially, and it's not a bad thing. It's uh, Basically, it's a good thing for science because it opens up a different approach to address certain problems. And uh, this is exactly what happens, for example, in our system. Uh, it is a multi-element system. Many people, maybe from the electronic engineering side, will uh, will, will look at our systems in our works, uh, which we will not show to everybody. But still, if someone had to look at it, they will probably say, oh boy, this is a, a very complex, a very sophisticated multi-element filter or something like that. Um, so in a way it is, but it's just very difficult to think about systems in that way. And I guess addressing your comment, it is not, um, uh, it is a tricky situation because for us, it has been an advantage to our technology. What I think I was trying to uh, address in my plenary talk is that sometimes metamaterial is absolutely not the key element. So the actual innovation may lie in something completely different. It is a, it is a standard system and to some extent, and metamaterial is there just to beautify the system and make it more uh, attractive to say that it's a new field, a new area. And this is, I think I've seen that in uh, both academic papers and some of the proposals in the past. So uh, that was that was that was mainly my uh, my uh, my comment was about that and whether metaboards is a meta material based system or not we don't know it's a kind of a gray area story 
and we're quite open about that. Yes. I mean, I would argue that it is because it is a key fundamental change on that one component within the system that brings about you know, systematic improvements over the pre-existing. Um, I'm going to go on to uh, Gleb here. Um, what's, what's your feeling? I mean, it, 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 I can see it as being a key part of your product there. Sure, yeah, it's absolutely, it's, it's an enabling piece for us, but you know, building a, a LiDAR system is so much more than the beam steering. And if you just look at the composition of our team, you know, we have 30 people, but you know, only 10 of those are devoted to the, to the beam steering technology and everyone else is devoted to the software and electrical engineers and optical engineers to, to bring the whole system to fruition. So it's really about solving the problem at the system level and then understanding what's required from the enabling technology to do that. Um, in other words, our metasurfaces don't have to solve all the problems. Um, they only have to solve the specific market and, and customer problem that we're going after. So for example, you know, our, our chips don't do everything. We don't do 2D beam steering. Um, they have a good enough switching speed for lighter applications, but they not, might not be fast enough for certain other applications. And so it, it was kind of a tops down and bottom up way that we approached it. There was the bottom up approach of what can you do with an optical meta surface in a reasonable amount of time and, and something that's manufacturable. And then there's the top down approach of, well, what problems can you solve with it? You know, maybe it's uh, optical communications, maybe it's, uh, displays, maybe it's, uh, in our case, LiDAR. And it turned out that the overlap between what you can do, the bottoms up to what is the market need, LiDAR was kind of the, the perfect uh, overlap for that because it turns out 1D beam steering is perfectly good for, for LiDAR because you can do the other axis in, in other ways. And you know, the switching speed was just right. So it's uh, you don't have to do everything. You just have to be super focused on solving a very specific problem. And so our approach will be different, say, from MetaBoard or MetaLens because they're solving a very different problem. Uh, and I think that's a very different, you know, that, that's kind of the, the approach of industry and startups in particular is just being super focused on the problem you're solving. Uh, there was a question here from uh, Tim who asked you directly, Gleb, how well does your system work in drones? Sure. Yeah, we have drone drone customers. Uh, you know, you can strap a lighter in the same way on a drone as a as a car. It depends on the specific requirements. You know, field of view, range, uh, that kind of thing. But absolutely, uh, Paul. A question for you, which is on a, on a similar trait. Was do you feel that the descriptor meta materials was a barrier or an opportunity to funding and commercialization of products? Uh, no, not at all. I think. Uh... You know, we had a great team, uh, great, you know, people hitting the roads. Um, so uh, we never really got any pushback from that. I think really, uh, you know, investors here are savvy, right? They, they want to know what is this thing going to do? They want to be able to sold that there is a product there, that this isn't just, um, you know, something that's sp being spun out of academia. And so, you know, what you're saying, what we were talking about previously uh, resonates a lot in that, uh once you can conceive of that vision, once you can show that there is a product, this is not just something that uh, we're kind of developing for a just broad-based sense. Once you can show that focus, then it's no problem, I think, uh, to get that funding. Well, that's good. And this, uh, you, the reason I asked that was on one of the earlier sessions, they were saying that there was a bit of pushback on people not fully understanding metamaterials at the beginning and the, the funders considering it as being a, I won't say science fiction, but hard to right. believe. It's, yeah, so it's it's about the product, right? It's not about the meta material per se. Yes, the products and the customers. So, so in the yeah. end, it's an opportunity because you can address a broader customer base. So, I mean, it, it doesn't hamper because I think there are always going to be some funders who are interested in the fact that this is a new technology. They they realize that this could be potentially something new, um, but at the end of the day, they're not going to put dollars. You know, on you, they're not going to put a place a bet on you until they can understand that, that there is uh, some way to commercialize this. If there is going to be people buying this thing, okay. um, and there's a question here from uh, Mitchell. 
uh, saying hi, Powell. Great to see you presenting, uh, representing uh, Metalens. Um, the question is, rather technical question, is are the mass manufacture of metal lenses made from titanium dioxide or another dielectric? And which region, which region of the visible can they work in? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, we are targeting near infrared applications. So our dielectric is actually silicon. Um, so that, that makes it easy. Uh, however, you know, uh, we are always interested in titanium dioxide. Uh, that is a, uh, a great material to work with for visible applications. And in that sense, um, titanium dioxide metamaterials can be used for you know, that spectrum of the, of the visible. Yes, so going to overlap well, so fantastic. Um, so actually, I'm going to ask this one uh, to uh, Arena, um, which is, do you need to handle any regulatory or reliability aspects in-house? For example, lifetime environmental testing, and how, or is it done by the system integrator? This is a very good question, and uh, again, it all depends on our customer. This is customer specific, so uh, we are market-wise, we are at the beginning of our journey, so we anticipate that our first customers will be the early adopters. So we we would expect that. A lot of this will be done uh, with their help or through them, or at least um, not entirely uh, within our responsibility area, because uh, obviously we want to be uh, on the market as quickly as possible. And uh, we hope to be uh, to be able to do this through an early adopter. Uh, likewise, we uh, we don't have an air house facility to do all the testing, but we are aware of, of where to go. And uh, yes, so essentially, long story short, the answer to your question is we would expect that the first customers will will be participating in the in, in the regulatory uh, uh, aspects of our technology. However, we we have put some thought into that, and uh, obviously, the there are certain standards that guide us uh, along the way. But it will eventually it will be a partnership between the early adopter and Metabos to align on on how to develop this into a finalized product or service. Do you see the use of meta materials causing any complexity on things like recycling or remanufacturing for the future? Uh, if this is a question for me, I guess. Uh, yes, uh, for, uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, specifically for us, it it has uh, zero impact on on the ch on the change. Uh, there is basically no. I'm trying to say that there is no change uh, in terms of recyclability, or uh, we're not making the system any greener per se, because uh, it's actually quite confusing for a lot of uh, potential customers and investors we're talking to, and and just people we talk to. Because as soon as you say meta material, people usually imagine something on a chemical level. So they would expect, especially when we're talking about uh, um, uh, wireless power that's usually related to magnetic fields. So people imagine a ferromagnetic material with some unusual properties and uh, immediately this association comes up. So this is why I keep saying we're not using a, a material. It's a, it is a way we arrange things and look at them mathematically or engineering wise. So uh, from that perspective, we're not changing anything in the ecosystem. However, uh, it's a bit of a stretch, but uh, we also think that this may lead to a greener ecosystem for charging. Again, it's a very long discussion. And just if we stop on the amount of wires people use, I think it's a step forward, not backward, because the amount of wires will be reduced. Again, uh, beyond that, there is a long discussion of whether that's a greener or 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 not. <laughs> Wait. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, next question is coming for um, Gleb from Mohammed, asking uh, asking well, stating first, congratulations for the excellent uh, products. Please, can you comment on the LCD module you are using to achieve the high speed of twenty five? microseconds this i think is the to Gleb is the switching uh, yeah sure that, that is um some of our core ip in how we uh are able to switch the liquid crystals so quickly um i'll say we we don't use exotic liquid crystals they are uh, they are conventional pneumatic liquid crystals but that's some of our core ip and how we switch them with such short time scales so 
yeah, 25 microseconds is about a hundred times faster than its typical fluid, liquid crystal displays. And I'm, I'm going to ask a question here, which is changing it slightly away from the technical, which is what do you see as being the best method for commercialization of your products? Best method in terms of a go to market strategy? Well, yeah, well, more of the, we, we were talking earlier on about the, the market wall that you, you, you're making a product which you believe will be used and successful in the market. Mm -hmm. But how do, you, how do you find it best to go and address that market and target yeah. that market and release a product that is the correct product? I see. Yeah. So I guess there's a couple aspects to it. You know, I mentioned a very broad market strategy, right? But you can't start with that, right? You have to build a first product and, and get traction in the market. So you, the key is identifying that first kind of beachhead market that's you, where you're most differentiated or that you can address the, the most quickly and then build credibility with customers and then expand from there. Right? So I think that that's one key. The other is, identifying where you want to play in the stack. You know, so our core technology is the, the beam steering, of course, right? So we could be just a beam steering chip company. Um, and we have some customers that we work with just around the beam steering. The problem with that is when you have a, a very new technology that customers or don't understand and they might not know how to build a system around it, you first have, you have to do that to show to the market that that's possible and then you can scale back and focus on the components, you know? So an analogy I'll give is uh, Intel back in the day, they used to build their own motherboards and even computers. And that's because their customers weren't always sophisticated enough to build the boards around their processors. So they had to go up the stack uh, and then eventually they got rid of that business. And I think that's, you have to do these reference designs and initial products just to seed the market with your core technology. And so we're following that, that path as well. Does that, I mean, does that use of, if I can change your words, your use of demo boards provided to the clients and customers, does that mean that you also get feedback on how best to improve your product for the future? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's very important uh, for us to engage with customers at the system level, not just at the component level, even if that's not our long-term strategy. Yeah. Uh, and the question continued to you, uh, which is from Tom asking, have you considered collision avoidance systems for, for civilian aerospace? Uh, we, we have uh, for the, the challenge with aerospace and collision avoidance is that you need usually from what I understand, very long range, right? And so that's a, a task better suited for uh, radar. Um, I, I not to say that our technology can't scale to very long range, but it requires a different, it, it's more about the overall system design and what kind of receiver and transmitter you're using. And so like coherent systems, for example, LIDAR coherent systems are better suited for these very long range applications. But our beam steering is compatible with that. It's just not the products that we're building right now. I might slightly argue that transponders are actually the, the main main use system on the on the systems mm -hmm. rather than a, a, a by sight, even if it's by radar or electro, electromagnetic. Thank you. Um, so um, yes, a question back to Pearl, uh, which is, so I just read it up for Mr. on my list here. For metamaterials, do you as a, a commercial company have to have close times ties with academia to develop those metamaterials? or do you develop them in-house? This is to Powell. Sure. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, we did spin out of academia. Um, we uh, keep tabs on academia, but I think uh, really um, we are interested in different problems than what academia is interested in, right? So again, like going back to, to actually making the product, making that product resonate with the customer, um, that also, raises a host of technical questions, which uh, we are the ones equipped to handle because that's not something that's gonna publish a paper, right, in academia. Um, and that's, I think, the, the main uh, difference in perspective. Um, so, of course, I think academia is great for like a hiring pipeline, let's say, uh, you know, uh, bringing in new talent, bringing in fresh ideas. Um, but, you know, the, the questions that we're answering are nonetheless a bit different. Yes, and I'd like to go, back to Rena and to Gleb, but we'll say Rena first, is that, because it's a very open question, this is that, 
do you as, as your company is developing for the future do you see you having to drop back in and look back at the academia the universities for future ideas or do you see the future ideas and development remaining within your companies Maria? Well, <clears throat> it is indeed an open question and uh, again being a small company uh, obviously we, we we like to think big uh, we're just an emerging business, but uh, we hope and we aspire to 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 keep this connection with the academia because this is this is the source of the emerging technologies in many ways. Uh, of course, uh, companies uh, they produce a lot of innovation, and it's usually hidden. It's usually published in the form of a patent. It's a very different channel of publishing your innovations, uh, and of course, they sometimes they are a little bit even more advanced than academia because a lot of academic uh, innovations or outputs, they are a bit premature. As soon as you have something new, you already published this. So you, you, you don't have the time to give it a second thought and uh, a second check and the viability check is not there. The important thing is just, just to get it out there first. So it's a race, which is quite different. So we, uh, we have uh, pondered on that, in fact, in, in particular, it just uh, resonates with what uh, Pavel just said. In particular, for our development process, um, we have collaborated with academia and we will collaborate with academia because uh, we think there are certain uh, uh, certain ways where we can work together, but not on the same um, not on the same area, so to say. So, if we could be complementary with the academia, then definitely we, we would like to be uh, there. We would like to use this connection uh, if what they develop is complementary to what we develop. And we can therefore strengthen the ecosystem for, for our market, we can strengthen our products, we can um, you know, educate the industry if you want, because both wireless charging and this NFC wireless charging and our product, they're all very new. Likewise, uh, we I think uh, all of us who have worked in the, on the industry side, we've all seen how uh, sometimes it is difficult to handle the IP if you work with academia, and this is both uh, related to the ownership questions, this is related to, again, the uh, difference in focus, because for us it is important to protect the information until it's ready to go. Uh, and for the academia, it is absolutely essential to publish, because this is, this is the bread and butter. For the young researchers specifically who are aiming for this career ladder, it is, it is just not possible not to publish. So, so yes, I think complementarity is key, at least for, that's how we have defined our uh, work with academia. And to Gleb, uh, same question. Yeah, I, I mean, I very much agree with what Arena and, and Paul said. Um, I, so in general, yeah, of course, we're, we're open to future collaboration with academia. Um, that's, of course, where I got my training in, in metamaterials, even though our technology wasn't spun out from from Duke, we kind of developed it de novo, but the, the training that I got at Duke plus, you know, the people that we've hired. So I think it's a great source of, of talent uh, and, and training. Uh, I think one of the challenges in industry academia collaborations is that I think as Arena alluded to is everyone just has different incentives, right? The, the incentives in, in academia are to publish quickly and in quantity, and, and I've been on both sides of it. So I, you know, as a postdoc, my incentives were to publish lots of papers so you can get an academic job, but you weren't really, you were judged on, you know, the novelty, but not its applicability or its usefulness. Um, and in industry, you know, what I tell my engineers is, it's okay to throw out 99% of your ideas because we can only pursue that 1% that's actually going to be practical. So there, there are many things that we've come up with that would make for great papers, but they just won't go anywhere. So you just have to, you, you have what I, I say, kill your darlings, right? You can have great ideas, but you just have to kill many, many of them because they won't go anywhere. And so it's a, it's a very different mindset. And, and continuing on that, uh, Gleb, um, what do you see your organization needing for the future and i'm saying that because of course i work for the knowledge transfer network and our job here is to network companies with other companies organizations and academia but what do you need what would you like to see happen for the in the future to make um the metamaterials industry uh, a success 
and your company is a success in the, in the, at the same time. And, and I'm asking that on basically on sort of um, education or more staff or more people or more knowledge of metamaterials. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, I think what the companies represented here are doing to a large degree is, is you know, one of the best things you can do is if, if there are successful uh, metamaterial deployments in the market, it becomes less of this uh a mystical and academic thing and it becomes more more real and i think that will that will drive future success so i think that that's a big part of it well how do you feel about that Eden? yeah i think uh so certainly in terms of training uh make getting people excited uh and interested in you know working for metal ends or whoever, uh, I think that can only be a good thing uh, to have that talent pool to draw from and to have that talent pool, you know, not jump ship to uh, you know, kind of a, a different track just to stay in uh, this kind of engineering application. Um, so I think you know, that, that could be helpful as well. Rina, what, 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 what do you say was the key thing that you'd like to see um, developed well, uh... or come about? They're ambitious, it's a huge stretch, but ideally the academia has to change a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that because uh, we've been with the electromagnetism as a, as a science, as a theory for a long, long time. It's, uh, there, it's not a new science per se anymore. So we have to be very careful when we say it's fundamental research because fundamental research is something completely unknown. So I think there is there has to be a better a better judgment about what is a novel science because a lot of research today is especially in the engineering uh, side of research is about a quick simulation of something with something on top and we say it's a it's a new device it's not a device at all so this sort of research has to be better focused and uh, these skills and the the wonderful enthusiasm of these researchers can be put uh, in uh, in a more focused uh, uh, in terms of focused fruit, so to say. So in that sense, I, I think, well, again, my, my personal view is that the initiatives of uh, creating hubs, such as, for example, at the Exeter University, they have a new metamaterial doctoral uh, uh, school. So it's a very holistic approach where PhD students are no longer on a singular journey. But the idea, I think, behind that is to kind of make them uh, more exposed to other areas and other people. Uh, so to some extent, they will be more prepared to the fact that there is something beyond what you are doing. So there is something else that needs to happen for this technology to become a device. And I'm talking about engineering science. So uh, in that sense, this, this, this would be a great step for academic, uh, for academic restructuring and, and changing the training. And I guess I, I agree with what Pavel just said. Uh, sorry, Gleb just said, well, what we are doing as, as, as emerging businesses is exactly what we should be doing to uh, to make a metamaterial industry a success. We need to see more examples of successfully launched products rather than promised products. And Metabots is not quite there yet, but we hope to be. So um, I guess I guess that's that's the best we can do. Um, and could I counter that by arguing that that once these products are launched, that the metamaterials will be hidden inside the product and the product will be the product alone so so there's going to be a bit of a drop-off on this in the future on the use it, of the word metamaterials in the future it could be actually and to some extent i think it is quite anticipated the, uh we within our company actually we use the word metamaterial less and less because uh, once it got over the excitement, the initial excitement about, oh, it's so new, it's so novel, the, the technology is so different from other wireless charging approaches. So we used to use metamaterial to explain why this is different. Now it's all about, okay, let's go back to the, to the, to the point of this. So what we are selling is a specific thing that makes A, B, and C. So uh, the functionality of metamaterials will be uh, the, 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 the first thing. And the metamaterials will be uh, hidden there. It's a good thing because ultimately, I think a while back I gave a talk, um, and I was still probably with academia, and I said, if if metamaterials uh, uh, 
are a successful uh, uh, is a successful area of science and research and innovation, it will eventually become so commonplace that people will stop saying metamaterial. It will be implied that structuring materials will be uh, some a method of engineering and a method of uh, achieving certain results. So I think it will be a very positive thing if we just stop saying metamaterials. <laughs> Gleb, I mean, you you, sh you showed the market as being many billion I, I, I remember from your slide you see the same thing that these your boxes on every car every drone every self-autonomous unit will just normalize it you see the word it, it will normalize it but I don't think um uh, that that it has to get lost necessarily what what's powering it I mean to take a very simple example even the layperson knows that their iPhone is powered by chips right silicon chips like they might not know how they work or exactly what it is but like even the average person knows like semiconductors and chips is a is a big thing and kind of makes the world run so uh, i don't think it necessary yeah i think there's an opportunity for people might not know what it means but the kind of the the, the term can can survive thank you uh, and and pal yourself but uh, again the question on the use of the word metamaterials will it roll off in the future or do you think there'll be new metamaterials for the future sure so i mean my presentation i, I talk about this as an extension of diffractive optics that's a term that lots of folks are familiar with and it's not uh not inaccurate right um so but i don't think it's again i'm kind of repeating what the other presenters have said it's not necessarily a bad thing that it that it hides or it uh um starts to uh, the, the verbiage changes right that's maybe just actually a, a marker of its success that we don't need to resort to rhetoric in some sense to to sell it um but yeah i think the the difference is and I'll, I'll borrow an analogy from david smith i don't know if he's listening but you know he always said that metamaterial is not a thing it's a design principle it's a way yeah. of thinking so it's i think that applies here i mean what we're doing our meta materials is very different than than what Meta Lens is doing, what Meta Boards is doing, and what Chimeta is doing. I mean, it's a it's just a design approach, but the actual implementation and the problems we're solving are they have very little to do with each other. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so I'm going to say any any more remarks from yourselves, please, before I thank you all and uh, do some housekeeping before the end. So I can only thank the three of you, and I'll just repeat you know, from Metaboard, Lumotive, and uh, Metalens, and and actually that comment there, not a thing. It is a design principle. I think that goes and highlights the the ability in the future of the commercialization of this, the fact that this is going to be it covers every aspect and can cover all aspects of different technologies and um, uh, markets. So this is a future uh, to be looked forward to. Uh, and again, thank you so much to the three of you for uh, presenting today and much appreciated and gave us a great insight to both your companies and the commercialization of meta materials. Um, moving on, I just wanted to go and to those who are watching, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for the questions. Um, I've been asked to go and remind you to please copy the link in the chat box to view the meta materials landscape map before you uh, you log off. There's a, a fantastic uh, metamaterials landscape map for you to look at. Please copy that link that should be there now for you to go and see. Uh, please do visit the exhibitors on the platform and connect with people. That's your way to go and connect with these speakers, drive the business, drive contacts, and make this technology go forward. Said we're here for the commercialization. Um, so also please book one-to-one uh, -one appointments with these attendees and other attendees, as well as the presenting companies. And all the recordings, I realize this is one session out of three that was on now. The two other sessions, uh, we went on antenna and the other one on power supplies. I know that they were fantastic as well. Please do go and watch them. They were absolutely great. Um, so again, thank you to the speakers. Contact, for your... They might not be available, Sven. Okay, okay, fine. Thank you. So, is... Okay, so I've just been... Re... The voice from the background just said that the videos might not be available just for the moment or maybe later on. They, they just need sign off from the presenters. So thank you for that. Um, so thank you to all the speakers for all your effort. Much appreciated what you've done here. Fantastic slides. 
And please do remember that, and I'm looking at my notes here, the panel discussion starts at half past four, so in 25 minutes time, where asking where will metamaterials find the greatest com commercial impact? I won't say I think we covered a lot of that just now, but that'd be a fantastic presentation. Please go along. Again, Paul, Gleb, Irina, thank you, and a massive thank you to uh, Anita in the background for doing the, uh, the hard work of doing, making this presentation such a success. Thank you to all. It's fun. Thank you.